good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today's session will be about managing water utilities through crisis. Uh, we have like over here two distinguished speakers. Um, but before we talk about this and before we talk about our speakers, I would like Mr. Kanal Azari, that you all know, <laughs> so needs no further introduction. Uh, he will talk about this issue from the MENA perspective to make an introduction to the subject so we can proceed with the international experience of this issue. Jerry Kanal. In fact, I'm uh, <laughs> not scheduled for this meeting originally. But we'd like to have you, so Thank you. Have to take this opportunity, you know? yeah. But the subject is very important to the people working in the water utilities, which mean the people, not the people who are planning for sectors or for finance or for obtaining doning or whatever like those very important issues rather for the people who are working on the ground who are in contact with the water issues every day those entities the water service providers are subject really to crisis from experience just i can summarize three kinds of major crises that may happen one of them, and the most important one, is the change of water or wastewater quality, the big change that may affect the public health. The second one is due to environmental conditions, severe ones, natural disasters, heavy floods, and so on that may destroy parts of the system suddenly. The third one is common and frequent, which is the, what we call local pollutions that may take place in a city two, three, four, five, six times a year where part of the network is polluted due to several reasons. Of course, all of those conditions need very, any, very quick reaction. You can't wait. Some of them can be with very significant impact. For example, when we say pollution, in Jordan, we had witnessed this case three times in the last 20 years. In one of those accidents, all the government fell down, including the Prime Minister, where pollution has took place in one of Jordan's uh, governorates called Mofrak. And that water from Mofrak is pumped to Amman and to Erbit in the north and the pollution took place at the water resource to the, to, the, to the aquifer itself. This was severe. The second case was when the Minister of Water and Irrigation, by mistake or by intention, I don't know, leaked some of the water from a dam. That water was a mixture of blended, blended water, rainwater, plus uh, uh, treated wastewater, and it was not treated properly. It was primary treatment, if you know technically what's primary treatment. And that water came to the intake of the pumping station, and it was pumped up to a man. The problem was the pollution that occurred at that time was with something called nematode, if you are familiar with. I'm sorry to talk any too much technical, but anyway, it's a small bacteria 
that was not in existence or unknown, unknown for for the utilities. But the water was smelling badly. So what to do? We stopped the water pump to Amman. 45% of Amman's population remained without water till we implemented a major emergency response plan and started uh, supplying them from other sources. I was the manager of the response plan, by the way, and it was very tough, very hard to apply, and it took us 25 days to bring the things back properly. And, and I, sorry, let me go to the third one, third one, which is the local pollutions. You know, in Jordan and other countries, I mean, it's not in Jordan, you have to the house, house connection, water house connection. You have wastewater house connection. If that house is not connected to the wastewater system, then you have septic tank. If the septic tank floods, the wastewater goes untreated under the ground. If there is a small leak in the water pipe, pollution to 50, 60, 70 houses may occur. This used to happen, we used to have something about the figure in 2006 in Amman was 17 cases per year. So we, used to, I don't want to talk too much about the responses, how we dealt with it, but it was dropped, now it's three per year, down from 17, but it happens in other parts of the of Jordan and in other countries I, I, as well. I remember once it happened something similar in Australia, which we consider as sophisticated. The whole city, I don't remember the name, but it's a city of about a million. City of about a million. All the water supplied to the people was diluted. And the government, even the central government there, helped the, the authorities and they started supplying the water with bottled water to the people. So, those crises may happen. What I want to see in general, why I'm telling those stories, the crisis may happen. The important thing is how quick you are responding to this crisis, which means the water utility anywhere, if don't, if, if the water utility do not enjoy proper governance and decision-making, quick decision-making system, then it's a catastrophe. Luckily, in our case, so the decision-making system and the autonomy that the water utility should have, should enjoy, are very important. In fact, this contradicts with the philosophy in some countries, among them is Jordan, where the government, okay, they establish water company, but they hold this company as hostage with the central decisions, finance, money, move, uh, regulations, procurement regulations, response, etc., etc. So the lesson to learn to face any crisis properly, number one, the people in charge of response should have proper authorities. If not, that crisis may go bigger and bigger with very bad results. I don't want to take the, the time, Ahmed and the ladies, so I stop here, but during discussion, if you have any questions, we may exchange experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer Kamal, as usual, excellent introduction. So we can kick off our meeting for today. Um, we'll start, the first speaker will be like engineer Nina Godgaz, is that right? <laughs> uh, she will talk about the water supply in emergencies 
and she will focus on benefits of household water treatment systems. Um, Nina has been project engineer since 2012 with focus on groundwater rehabilitation, reuse of industrial wastewater and desalination combined with renewable energy. With the last years, she participated in several humanitarian aid projects and is part of the ARC Nova Emergency Response Team. Currently, she is working at the German SME Delta. Please. still a couple of people are here despite the time and uh, the, the long conference so far. I will actually focus more on um, the people we don't get with the utilities, the people that do rely on water sources that are not improved yet. So this is a little bit different from most uh, topics we have had here during the last days and sessions. Um, Nonetheless, I think it's really important and it's a more global issue. It's not focusing on the MENA region, but it is really a global challenge and um, we will have uh, different causes for it. Might it be um, internal displacement, crisis, etc. Um, but also just poor conditions in communities. Um, before I start, I still would like to uh, draw attention to another topic, which I think has been missing a little bit here throughout the last days. And that's why I did want to put it in the presentation here. We did talk a lot about how can we save water? How can we actually reduce our demand of water? And at least in the sessions I've been joining, agriculture was always an issue, but no one did actually tackle the issue of food waste. And if we do look at the food we waste, it's about one third of the production. This one third, if we then look at the amount of water we need in the agricultural sector to supply all this food, we do see we do have quite a potential here to reduce our water demand. If we look at Jordan, we have about 50 percent, I mean this is a little older number, but still about 50 percent of the total water amount contributing from agriculture. And then we look at what we waste per person in terms of food. So uh, I think this is really an issue we have to look at. I know it has nothing, nothing really to do with the utilities, but there we have to think in a broader picture, and I think we do have to do this on a bigger scale. Um, so, okay, that's just one thought I wanted to get rid of, and uh, now um, back to my actual presentation. Um, if we do look at the water supply under pressure, I know here we have a really severe situation due to a lack of actual water resources. If we look globally, we have several issues contributing to um, pressure on the water contribution systems. And we do have to keep in mind that we have about 70 million people globally as refugees. About 85% of these are in internal displacement in low income countries. So we do not only have quite a couple of people on the move, dislocated from their homesteads, and thus not in the area where they can rely on their um, actual water supply system. But we also have these people in low income countries where we don't have a lot of governmental support in a lot of cases for infrastructural measures. If we look for the causes for these refugee um, amounts, we do have natural catastrophes on the one side. And here if we do just consider this number since 2010, we will see that we had about 2,000 catastrophes that had been classified as such and at least 100 of them did affect more than 50,000 people. That's quite a number. And of course, these events we can expect to um, increase throughout the next years due to climate change. Having more contribution by drought and uh, also flooding. I mean, we see both effects globally. And if you do look at the map here and the areas affected, and if you then look at a map, okay, I hope you can actually see this. Um, contrast is not so good. This is a list of uh, the armed conflicts the U.S. Council um, for Foreign Relations lists as conflicts with an impact on U.S. interests. So we're not talking about all um, conflicts there are, not all armed conflicts, but only on the ones that are actually considered to be uh, 
having some sort of impact on the US interest. And we do see some correlation to areas where we also have natu natural catastrophes. Looking further, water scarcity. We will see some correlations again here if we look at a global map on water scarcity. And of course, we know the MENA region, we do have a problem with the water scarcity. But we also see a lot of other regions on the globe that do face severe challenge regarding water supply in the future and over extracting the natural resources. The uh, WHO said we have about 2 billion people at the moment lacking safe access to water supply. And a lot of them will be in exactly these areas where we have either the armed conflict, the natural catastrophes, or the severe water scarcity. And again, a lot of these areas are some with a severe population increase. So we have high birth rates. This will increase our problem here, for sure. If we now look at the um, part of um, people that actually are without basic access to drinking water, there's still about 800 million. <coughs> Still quite a number, I think. And that's after we met MDG goal. So we did meet our goal of halving the number of people without basic access to drinking water. And still, there's almost a billion without it. So if we look at the sources these people have in a lot of cases, it is not improved water sources. It is not piped systems, but it is the well around the corner. It might be the river stream. And it will, in most cases, not be treated